Hey gang, it is Wednesday. It's my favorite day of the week. Well, maybe other than Friday, but this is, no, I'm going to say it. It's my favorite night of the week. This is the night that we do hump day happy hour. So welcome to that event. This is hump day happy hour with your dentist in the know. That's Dr. Chad Duplantis. I'm Dr. Jeff Horowitz. We're here just enjoying our favorite beverage. We're going to talk some dentistry. Unfortunately, uh, there's a nasty little bug running around in North Carolina. So uh, the brains of this operation is not going to be with us tonight. Dr. Jennifer Bell, uh, we miss you, JB. And uh, we'll butcher the news a little bit so it'll make you feel more needed because you are. Anyway, welcome to Dennis in the Know. Um, we're here to bring you all of the most timely information in an honest fashion. And it's your backstage past to current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. It's live. It's over a cocktail. So welcome. There's kind of a unique situation. Uh, we're going to get serious here for a minute, but there's a unique situation that has oddly affected the three of us in a very... Uh, in very different ways, but uh, Jeff and I very similarly. So uh, I, I didn't shed a lot last year, and I wish I would have because I think we need to bring light to this. But Jeff, would you would you be willing to share with us maybe what's been going on this week, or would you? Or do you want? Yeah, no, no, that it, it, it's fine, and and I think that I think we just need to look a little bit harder at this. Um, and it, it totally took us by shock. So my son had been having some. Uh, GI issues. He'd been having, you know, quite a bit of cramping and, but, you know, he was in college. He eats like crap. He drinks too much like every college kid should, you know, I, I, not that he was doing anything more excessively than anyone else, but, you know, we're like, look, you know, four years of eating like crap and drinking too much and, you know, it's not good for you, but, um, it got really bad and it, it got to the point where he couldn't leave the house. He was buckled over in pain. He was experiencing some, some bleeding and he, he, you know, he was embarrassed. He couldn't even leave the house. And, uh, so when this went on for a couple of days, you know, um, in fact, the, the day, the day he called in the worst pain, I said, listen, don't mess with this anymore. Just go to the emergency room. I'll follow up with you. I was I was still away, but I was coming home um, a couple of days after that. And um, and so he went to the emergency room. They told him he had a weird E. coli infection, but that uh, a lot of inflammation in his gut and, uh, you know, could be colitis as well. Maybe it was triggered by the E. coli, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, a good friend of mine who happens to be a gastroenterologist up here, I, I spoke with him and he's like, let me, give me his number, I'll call him. And so, you know, it's one of the blessings of being in, in the medical world and, and having some friends like that. So um, he calls down there and he, he calls me back. He's like, look, I think the E. coli thing was just really strange and out there. He's like, he's on an antibiotic. That's going to clear up. He shouldn't be having this kind of pain and he shouldn't be having, uh, you know, this, this kind of bleeding, um, from an E. coli infection. He goes, I think it's going to be ulcerative colitis. He said, but bring him up here. We'll do a colonoscopy. We'll, we'll get him taken care of. So I went down to Charleston, brought him back here. And, um, you know, he had an endoscopy within, you know, within, uh, three days of us getting them up, uh, not an endoscopy, excuse me, a colonoscopy within three days. And um, doctor said to us, and he, you know, he took a lot of pictures and said to us, I don't know how this kid was even upright when mm -hmm. he walked in here. He's like, this is one of the worst cases of, of ulcerative colitis that I've seen. And you know, just looking at the pictures, you don't have to be a physician mm -hmm. to know that that's not what it's supposed to look like. Looks kind of like uh, lichen planus of the intestines. Yeah. Oh, it, <laughs> yeah. It, it is. It was the angriest yeah. looking thing that that I've ever seen. And um, and and it just it takes you back because the first things they talk about is, you know, a lifetime 
of medication and lifestyle mm -hmm. changes. And you know, I, I don't know that I'm, I don't know that I'm really ready for that. And, and Chad, you went through this, what, six, seven months ago now. And, uh, um, a year ago in July with my Is daughter, it a yeah. year? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, yeah. And so we were all kind of with you looking for answers, but you know, JB's got this going on in, in her family uh, with one of her loved ones. And I just, I don't get why we're hearing these, these autoimmune issues so often in, in kids, you know, at such a young age now, it just, it seems like you almost never heard that in, in, you know, a lot of younger people. And I, and I feel like it's just striking so many people and, um, yeah. So it, you know, that, that's what we've been, we've just been kind of nursing Joel and, um, but the worst thing in the world is watching your child in, in pain and yeah, he's a 22 year old man, but still hurts just as bad. Man, I, Jeff, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sorry I put you on the spot, but we didn't even get to talk about that, but you're right. It is, it is, it is very painful, but I thought it was really, uh, important that we talk about it because last week, uh, May 19th was world, uh, colitis day. And, and I think there's, there's a lot of misinformation and so many of my dental colleagues don't know enough about it, you know? And, uh, when we heard that diagnosis, I was like, oh, sweet colitis, we take a pill and we good, you know? And come to find out, like you just said, it's a lifelong uh, affliction that's that Joel, your son, is going to have to take medication for, and that that he's going to, uh, you know, have have you know, to deal with for the rest of his life. But I think it is manageable, and my hope is is that we do find a cure in our kid's lifetime because Ava has been dealing with it for a year, and I can tell you that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we are starting to find relief, and hopefully we can help you guys get there sooner. But I just thought it was really important that we talk about it. You know, I mean, we, we, we spill our guts on, on this show, but I think we need to bring awareness as well. So thank you. I, I, I think it's a great point. And I, you know, I I'm all for asking lots of questions and, yep. and I think something that happened during COVID um, unfortunately was that, you know, you're, you're almost looked down upon when, when you ask questions that might, that might buck whatever the, you know, the current trends in, in thinking are. And, you know, the only way we move forward right now, there are no fixes for this right now. There is management for this. So why can't we have a conversation about potential fixes and, you know, just, just keep open minds. And, and so, you know, I, I know Chad and I are going to be putting our heads together with, along with our wives, Ellen and Jenny. And, um, you know, I've already had a couple of really good conversations about, um, things like ozone therapy and, um, testing for food allergies. And, mm -hmm. you know, th there's, there's so many more things than that can be done that maybe don't have randomized controlled trials associated with them at this point, but have very little risk and, and some potential reward. And so why not look at some of those things? And, and that's kind of where we're at is, you know, maybe we can advance the science of something that's outside the scope of the mouth. And you know what? Maybe we can also bring to light on some of the oral complications that can occur as a result of the therapy that they're undergoing and the autoimmunity as well. So, so the moral of the story is, is that we're on a mission and, uh, just from me to you, I'm in it with you, brother. Well, every wow. step of the way. So thanks. And we've, we've been there with you guys the whole way. And, uh, and in fact, right before I was supposed to meet you in Dallas, um, Jenny actually printed off all this dietary stuff for me to bring to you guys, which, you know, now we're having a photocopy at first before I send it to you. So, <laughs> well, well, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to go over that. And that was just really, really nice of you guys to do for us. So, uh, let's carry on, man. I think, uh, we have a great guest tonight. You want to talk uh, we, about our guest? Yeah, we, we have one of my favorite guys in the world, and, and he, he doesn't need a formal introduction at this point because you all have met him a bunch of times. He's one of our favorite people. He's such a brilliant guy, and, uh, you know, especially given the fact he comes from New Jersey. 
But uh, one of my favorite people in the world and, and somebody that every time he comes on, we get such positive feedback and everybody just wants to know more because he just he comes at this not from the dental perspective necessarily, but from the perspective of a pharmacologist. And so our favorite pharmacologist, Dr. Tom Viola, is here with us um, and He's going to be talking uh, about several things. We're going to talk a little bit about pain management. We're going to talk a little bit about antibiotic therapies and, and prophylaxis and uh, just lots of good stuff that everybody's always asking questions about. So, um, Chatty, you want to bring our, our good friend Tom Viola up? I do. Hey, Tom. What's up, hey, buddy? Hey, Tom. How's everybody doing? It's good to see you guys again. You as well. Good to see you as well, Tom. Good to see you as well. It's it's always good to see you, my friend. How's what's Maybe. happening in Jersey? Give me the Jersey rundown. It's been so long since I've been back. Well, we had one day of spring, and yeah. now it's summer. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to New Jersey. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you say that in the in the I Love Dentistry Facebook group today. Someone says, "What's your favorite season?" And you know they name all the seasons, and I said, "Well, in Texas, we have summer and winter. We seem to skip the two moderately temperatured seasons." I'm glad to hear that we're not the only state that does that. But you are not the only ones. No, we, I, I will be fair and say we did have a bit of an extended spring this year. I think we had three days. So, and then we jumped right into summer. We became like 90 degrees this past weekend, which we love. Look, look, look I'm, I'm the first one to complain about being too cold in the winter, but I'll be the one that's going to be complaining it's too hot in the summer too. So. Kind of what's, what's your temperature right now? I believe we're in, uh, let's see, it's 61 degrees right now. Okay, so, okay, we're, we're close. We're actually 70, we were 72 on my way home from work, which was our high today, which was pretty interesting for this late in the season, but we did get a lot of rain. So so glad uh, glad you guys are, are uh, somewhat yep. normalized. I'll, I'll take it as long as it's not 71. No. What to do what? As long my as thermostat not, says 71. I like <laughs> to keep my air there. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. Good, 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 good. Well, Tom, we have a lot to talk about tonight. And, uh, you know, we were talking about things that we wanted to talk about. Um, and, you know, buddy, I, I'm going to let you start with what you had mentioned. So you had talked about uh, amoxicillin was it amoxicillin usage and implant failure? Yes. All right. Fire away. Well, as, as much as I'd like to say there's a direct connection, it's absolutely not direct. It's more indirect. And this was a study that was uh, done by NYU. And it said that patients who were allergic to penicillin had a greater risk of implant failure. And I've thought to myself, well, that's something I've never heard before. Let me look into it. But it, what it really turns out to be is this. For patients who have penicillin allergy, who use agents other than amoxicillin, they're more likely to have implant failure than patients who used amoxicillin. So it wasn't the penicillin allergy that actually caused the implant failure. It was the fact that they were using different agents than amoxicillin that caused the implant failure. The tough part for me, the pharmacologist at this point is, okay, but give me more. You know, what caused it? What exactly happened that, that made those implants fail versus patients who used amoxicillin whose implants didn't fail? And we really don't have an answer to that. Believe it or not, even though the study was published, there've been various theories, but there's nothing specific about why Patients who used amoxicillin did better overall with their implants and patients used other agents. But then it started me thinking about the whole idea of why we prescribe amoxicillin in the first place. And so I, I got to looking into it a little more deeper and I discovered that a lot of this had to do with prophylaxis. And you know, guys, if you know me well enough and long enough, and I would consider you guys good friends to know that I'm not a big fan of prophylaxis. Uh, and the reason for that is because there's no evidence to suggest that it actually works. But let's let's break it up. Let's let's talk about infective endocarditis prophylaxis and joint replacement infection prophylaxis. Okay, let's pick the uh, hard target first. Infective endocarditis prophylaxis. 
far be it from me. I'm not the clinician. So in that respect, I'm not the dentist. So far be it from me to tell you how to practice. But if you look at the data, it says one. Overall, it's probably a good idea to prophylax for infective endocarditis. Because even though there are studies that keep coming out that say, you know, like for example, a study came out of Sweden that said, well, look, Sweden doesn't prophylax. We don't do infective endocarditis prophylax. So take a sample of patients from Sweden and take a sample of patients from, let's say, Great Britain, where they do prophylax, right? And let's compare them. Try to get them on equal terms as far as, you know, did they have a history of ineffective endocarditis? Did they have a procedure done that, you know, would, would increase the risk of infective endocarditis? Was the, the frequency of infective endocarditis any better, or, or sorry, was, was there a greater frequency of infective endocarditis in, in the Sweden where they don't prophylax versus Great Britain where they do? And the answer was no. So you could assume that means what? Well, if that's the case, then there's really no reason why we should be prophylaxing. But while that was the information on uh, like a 10,000 foot level, when you really dug into it, you found that there were some flaws in the way the study was conducted. And there usually is. <laughs> right. Take it from yeah. me. That's all I do all day is look at studies. And I, and I say to myself, okay, well, I'm not going to base changing a policy that we've been using for, you know, for years on the results of one study. Now, let's look at it a different way. Has there ever been a case where we've prophylaxed, then stopped prophylaxing, and then in that same country, was there a, a, a tendency for cases to go up or down? Okay, what was done in London? So for a while, we stopped prophylaxing. What did we discover? Effective endocarditis, effective endocarditis cases went up. So again, that leads me to believe, okay, maybe there is something to this prophylaxis thing. But what really should be our point is, who is a candidate for infective endocarditis prophylaxis? And even the American Dental Association and the American Heart Association will tell you what, it's really a small population. It's patients who've had infective endocarditis in their past, or patients who've had congenital heart disease that was repaired with something prosthetic, or someone who has a prosthetic heart valve or something prosthetic that they've had implanted. Those are the folks. But Look, mitral valve prolapse, stop yeah. the insanity already, okay? No more. Okay. Now let's take it from the patient's perspective. There are patients out there who've been taking amoxicillin because they had MVP 20 years ago. Guess what? They're still demanding it. Yeah. No matter what you and I say, do, stand on our head and say, look, it doesn't work. It never did work. We never should have done it to begin with. Your patient knows one thing. I'm not going to die of effective endocarditis because you're not giving me amoxicillin. I'll get it somewhere. I'll get it from my general practitioner. I'll get it out of my kid's bottle if I have to. I'm <laughs> going to get my amoxicillin. So it's a very small subset, but it's enough that I think there may be something to it. And I don't want to change policy, even though there's absolutely no study that's ever been done that has actually proven that you can prevent infective endocarditis by using prophylaxis. To my knowledge, there's no- Yeah, the, the big argument, Tom, too, is, is this, that most of the procedures that we do in general dentistry, you know, taking, taking surgical procedures out of it where there's, there's actually no cutting or, or anything really invasive, almost none of those are any more invasive than the act of flossing. Or brushing the teeth. Yeah. yeah. So yep. really, you know, we're prophylaxing them on one day when we're flossing them or doing something that is the equivalent of flossing them. And then they're going home and doing it themselves. So it's obviously a, a CYA thing at that point, right? The well, memory, Jeff, I, 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 you hit the nail right on the head. And Tom, I, I, I wanted to say this too. I think compared to the UK and compared to it was Sweden that you said, I, I believe that we're a much more litigious society. Yes. And, and, I, and I believe that whenever I've had a patient that lost a knee, I got the call. It was my fault that they lost their knee because of the dental procedure, which he was prophylactically covered for. I had another patient that ended up with an infection that was later found out to be 
from a uh, uh, some some bad food that they had in Mexico. The infectious disease doctor said that it was an infection because she was not prophylactically covered for her dental appointment, but there was no reason that she should have been prophylactically covered at that point in time. And, and it seems like the dentist is kind of the go-to for, to blame for any of these, these situations, which is sad, which is really, really sad. And so, um, I, I tend to agree with you yet. I will, I will often defer to the orthopedic surgeon or the cardiologist or the family practitioner or the AHA guidelines. And I, I, I think we have agree. to, I mean, yeah. agree. You know, oh, we have. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I'm, I'm going to agree with both of you and say, look, and I, I've said this many times, brushing and flossing alone introduce enough bacteria in your bloodstream that that you've got the issue right there. Wiping your hiney after you go poopy introduces yeah. bacteria in your bloodstream. So you're going to get bacteria in your We've bloodstream. We've had so tonight. much poop talk. You can't even bother me with that. Yeah. There's been yeah, so much poop <laughs> talk in my house. We're poopy good. <laughs> so. So the point is, there's always going to be an entry point. And let's face it, what we do in dentistry, if you think about it, when your patient has periodontal disease, what do you say? Brush and floss. Well, really what you're doing is stuffing bacteria and inflammatory mediators in their bloodstream anyway. So yeah. you're right. So the whole point is it's litigious and we we prophylax because we'd see uh, CYA. I, that's what, that was going to be my next point, Chad. So you said, that's why we do it for no other good reason. Now, if you want to separate these two out, if we talk about joint replacement infection, now this is a different animal because there's no study that's ever proven that it's effective. The ADA says don't do it. The AAOS, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, says right on the website, don't do it. And, and the only time it should be done is for a very small population of people who are, are immunocompromised, usually yes. because they have diabetes, you know, out patient of control. Patient by diabetes. patient basis. Absolutely. Exactly. But again, to your point, Chad, if someone's going to get the blame, it's going to be the person who didn't follow the protocol, the yeah. guidelines. So in this case, we prescribe. Now, I went to speak to orthopedic doctors. And when I spoke to them, this is their perspective. Ready? Have you ever had a joint replaced, Viola? No. You know what it's like? No, it's horrific. And it costs a lot of money. And it costs a lot of downtime. And it's a lot of pain and suffering. And guess what? It's worse the second time around. So don't be stupid. Give them the amoxicillin because it's 250 grand to replace the knee a second time and it's four bucks for amoxicillin. So then I say, well, wait a minute. That's not the point. The point is we're supposed to be stewards, right? We're supposed to prevent over-prescribing because of the potential for resistance. And we only have a very small arsenal in dentistry, so that's why we're so protective. And their comeback was, I you think you're the only ones that over-prescribe amoxicillin? Every pediatrician in New Jersey over-prescribes amoxicillin. So, so your four capsules isn't going to do much for anything. So I get their point. But what irks me is when, when it's required, they make us write the script. And really, it should be them yes. writing the script. It's not yeah. the curve war. It's just that they should be writing the script because it's their, it's their patient in that respect, and it's their request. Yeah. They make us write the script. And to your point, Chad, if they didn't write it and someone comes back and points the finger, I'm going to give the amoxicillin anyway. Hopefully, well, with the entrance of new professionals in the in the in the profession, it'll start to wane. You know, we're talking about this antibiotic stuff, and I, I'm going to go on a slight tangent for a little bit. But we've decided, Tom, and and with your with your blessing, that we're going to try and do this quarterly with you, right? I'd love to. So, yeah. So the last time you were on, we were talking about uh, uh, pseudomembranous colitis and clindamycin. All right. Well, if you heard. Jeff and I talking prior to bringing you on, we were talking about both of our kids being inflicted with ulcerative colitis. So my daughter has this issue a few months ago and she's got raging ulcerative colitis and the physician, not the GI doc, prescribes her clindamycin. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, I, she, my wife comes home and she's like, hey, this is what they gave Ava. And I'm like, no. No way in hell. Oh. I go, I'm not a rocket scientist. And I'm sure as hell not a physician. But right now, we just had a conversation about this last week. And I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm putting her on clindamycin. Chad, what was what was she prescribed that for? Uh, trying to think what it was. I think it might have been uh, a skin infection or, or something. So, it, was, it, would be, so yeah. it wasn't prescribed by the GI people. No, 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 no. And okay. I'm like, I'm like, what the hell? And so I like, we just had this conversation with Tom last week 
And, and you know, there's been so many cases of pseudomembranous colitis that have come to light. And literally like two days later, I saved the, uh, the magazine or the journal because I want to read it. There was an article that came out by the ADA or the AGD on C. difficile in, in, uh, in, in dental patients. And I was like, holy crap. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh, it was by the Texas Dental Association that published that. And I was like, man, you know, what the hell? So anyways, my wife called the doctor and was like, hey, these are our concerns. And we ended up getting something else. Granted, none of them are good. I mean, we're concerned whenever she goes on any antibiotic, especially a broad spectrum antibiotic. Yes. But it just, it, it's just crazy. You know, we, we, we know enough to be dangerous, obviously, but we also know enough to be safe as well. So, yeah. uh, and sometimes we're correcting the people that should theoretically know a little bit more about us, you know? So next time I'm just calling Tom. <laughs> don't, I will say this, and, and I don't, I mean, all due respect to the American Heart Association when I say yeah. that, but, but you saw the guidelines changed, right? And they said, you know, don't use clindamycin anymore because clindamycin has been linked to the greater incidence of C. diff related infection. So mm -hmm. use cephalexin or use azithromycin or use doxycycline. Okay, the problem, of course, is what? You can't use cephalexin in penicillin allergic patients yes. because there's a potential right. for cross sensitivity. So that takes Keflex and pretty much puts it aside. Are you going to use azithromycin? Azithromycin has been linked to ventricular and atrial arrhythmia, as well as drug interactions. How, uh, Tom, Ooh. so, and, yeah. and then also we have a question. Um, Alan Stern is is with hey, us Alan. tonight on the show, and what a great guy. And, and great guy. let me ask this question first, because Alan wanted to know, um, how he wants to know how could we possibly get sued for following the guidelines, um, and that uh, he's also seeing more and more orthopedic surgeons that are not pre-medicating pre -medicating patients after a really short period uh, following surgery. So, what do you say to that? Yeah, well, first things first. I mean, if you remember this, the way the docs used to say it was, if you had a knee replacement or a joint replacement, you had to take your amoxic your amoxicillin or your antibiotic prophylaxis. Two weeks, six months, two years, the rest of your life, the rest of your kid's life. I mean, how, however long it took. Your children have to your take children, a box of they, they have to take it too, forever. Like, so, okay, so when does it stop? Okay, so to Alan's point, and I love Alan. He's, he's a great guy, great guy ever. So well, that makes one of us. <laughs> he says he's seeing less. I'm saying, bravo, you're seeing less and shorter periods of time. Great. But can you be sued for following the guidelines? Technically, yes. If you use clindamycin and a patient develops C. diff, yeah, you're going to be brought into that case along with the orthopedic doctor because you had a hand in it and the pharmacist is probably going to go with you too. Everybody gets dragged in at once. So, okay, so I follow the guidelines and I get sued. That's why I think, I think my opinion, the American Heart Association says move clindamycin out, but you're running into problems now with azithromycin, potentially for arrhythmia. And what are you going to use then? Doxycycline? Doxycycline is bacteriostatic. Mm -hmm. It's probably not going to do the job as well so I'm going to say off the top of my head, most docs, I can't tell them what to do, but I'll bet most docs will continue to use clindamycin because when you have soft tissue related infection, when you've got, you know, what's beyond what amoxicillin could do, you're going to use clindamycin. So yeah. Tom, uh, thank you for that answer. But, um, and I'm going to get back to my question now, because we were just talking about azithromycin and uh, the, the uh, correlation with, with uh, arrhythmias and just how significant is that? Because um, I think a lot of people think of a, of a Z pack as just a really benign thing. What, what is the, the true, uh, what, I mean, what is the true percentage of, of patients that experience difficulty with, with arrhythmias or what, what is it a long QT segment or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 How about that? I know. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> well, I will say this. There's no percentage that I know of. Okay. It's never really been studied in that light. They do say that there's a, a prevalence uh, in patients who are predisposed. So who's What does that mean to us? Well, <laughs> so that's what I want to know. Okay. So what do you have to do? to? We're not cardiologists. Yeah, right. How do I predispose myself to QTs? I, okay. So using other drugs that prolong the QT. So there are some medications like quinolone antibiotics that prolong the QT, some anti-psychotherapeutic uh, uh, drugs prolong the QT. 
So if you're on one of those drugs, but don't forget, we use a drug every day in dentistry that can affect the QT, anesthetics. So, so is, if I give a patient who I just administered anesthesia to a prescription for a ZPAC, am I giving them a combination that can increase their risk of arrhythmia? Perhaps, but we just don't know the data to determine if that's really significant or not. I would say based on all I've, I've seen, it may not be significant enough but at the same time, now you're weighing the two lesser of two evils. Do I right. give the myosin and worry about C diff, or do I give AIDS of the myosin and worry about prolonged QT and potentially arrhythmia? So you're really weighing the two de demons here. And most of the times we end up going with what we know, which is in less than seven days of therapy, typically clindamycin doesn't cause C diff related diarrhea. But can it cause? Absolutely. It can, but typically it doesn't. Beyond seven days, it seems like, anyway, to me, the incidence is greater. But remember, guys, any antibiotic can cause C. diff-related problems. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether it's clindamycin or not when you think about it. Man, I love these conversations. It just brings me back to pharmacology, which I absolutely hated. But, you know, the thing is, is like you, you just have a way of relating it. I wish you taught pharmacology to me. I might have remembered something. <laughs> Uh, you know. I learned a lot from you guys just listening before. No, I, I, really? I wow. actually, I appreciate these courses more after I graduate. hundred percent. And, and, you know, I go back and I say, man, I wish I'd have been more into it, but you know, you're right. Tom Viola wasn't teaching us. Well, I also wish I'd have paid more attention in history, but that didn't happen. And now it's, now I appreciate it more too. So, you know. <laughs> exactly. so, uh, Switching gears, um, there's there's a lot of talk, and I think we talk about this every time, but let's talk about some trends in pain management, and specifically from my good friend, Dr. Ryan Walsh, um, he asked what we were talking about before the show, what are your thoughts on narcotic slash ibuprofen drugs for uh, pain management? He's speaking in specifically for endodontics, but I think it could go surgery as well. If we have to prescribe a narcotic, how many days would you feel comfortable prescribing? So let's talk about narcotics first, then let's talk about narcotic alternatives because maybe this will change his mindset. All right, I'm gonna tell both of you guys that I get into a lot of hot water with other speakers on, on dental pharmacology when it comes to this topic because almost everyone I know who's another in, in this same vein as me as a speaker tends to say what? Stop prescribing opioids. It's not necessary to prescribe opioids. You can get by with ibuprofen and acetaminophen. Don't prescribe opioids. And by the way, don't prescribe opioids. And my position is very different because I believe that there will always be a place for opioids in dentistry, but it may not be exactly what you think. So in my opinion, opioids are necessary in dentistry because the ibuprofen and acetaminophen combination we often prescribe will handle moderate to severe pain, but not severe pain. When you have severe pain, you need an opioid. When, when acute inflammatory pain becomes that egregious that the patient is in constant, never-ending pain, they need an opioid simply for their sanity, just to get back to some semblance of control over the pain. But I'll tell you, because I'm the pharmacist, what really happens. When you prescribe an opioid, they come to me, the pharmacist. They hand me the prescription, and they say, what is this? And I say, it's an opioid. And they say, I don't want it. I got kids. I got grandkids. I don't want it in my house. And as soon as they walk away, what I say to myself is score one for the dentist. Why? Because what you did was treat their pain with an opioid without an opioid ever leaving my pharmacy. Because the simple matter is when they go home and they're in agonizing pain, they're going to say to themselves, it's so bad. All right. If it's that bad, I'll go back and get the prescription filled. But they never go. They never come back to get it. So you treated their pain with an opioid, but really what you did was give them hope. If you don't prescribe the opioid, I'll tell you what happens as the pharmacist. They go home, they're in agonizing pain, and they say, man, the doctor didn't give me anything for this kind of pain. And now they blame you from number one. But number two, they call someone who they know has opioids tucked away just for such an emergency, and they get them anyway. Tom, thank, thank you for saying that, first of all, because I've always been of the opinion that in, really in life, but in, in medicine as well, you know, we tend to live on this pendulum that goes 
you know, just like politics, all the way left and then all the way right and then all the way left. And that's really where we've been with opiates. And I always and, and I have no problem justifying that if there is a really invasive procedure, a really difficult extraction, we're pounding on bone for a while, we're cutting on bone and we've got them flapped ear to ear, they are going to hurt. I don't take the and, damn opiate for a day or two. I'm not going to give you enough to become a junkie. You know, I'm not calling yeah. in refills. I'm getting you through a couple of days where you can feel like a human being. So I really appreciate you saying that because what I'm seeing, and, and I've seen this like in newer associates as well, is they almost feel like if they prescribe an opiate that they're creating a junkie or that, you know, this is something that they're not supposed to do. And I'm saying, no, you are the doctor. You know what's going to cause pain and what's going to make your, you are responsible for the care of your patient. Your pain. And if your patient is going to hurt, give them something to take care of the hurt, but not allow them to become a junkie. I mean, it's pretty simple. So well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> you Let, Let's face it. And I, I say this with love, okay? Your colleagues in medicine are out there prescribing 90 at a time, 120 at a time, 180 at a time. You prescribe six. Basically, you suck as a prescriber when it comes to open. <laughs> I know. But, but we but love you. Why do ever come to us? <laughs> yeah. You know, and there, there's the thing is that if you have a procedure done that requires surgery in a medical setting, that is going to give you the most. But as far, we all know that dental pain can be excruciating. That what ma that's what made us years ago the easiest to get it from because we know the quality of pain that they're having. Well, but and the it's most easy to I fake. To do what? It's easy to fake too. It, exactly. Right. And yeah, so the most I ever prescribed, I think at one time was 16. That was my limit. 16 for a really in-depth surgery. But I'll never forget, uh, she may be watching tonight, but a really good friend of mine um, had had knee surgery and and was given like 120 and just basically told, hey, just take them, you know, like they're candy. Just take them. I don't want you to be in pain. That's the last thing that I want. I want I don't want you to be in pain. And I remember about two weeks after they were out of the 120 and they called me and they're like, hey, can you refill this? I'm like, absolutely not. No. And there was a real anger. And then once the mind cleared, there was a big time. Thank you. I didn't realize where I was headed until you put the brakes on. And, and I think that all too often, like, especially now in Texas, and I don't know how it is in South Carolina, Jeff, but we're required to look up their uh, narcotic history. And I mean, some of the people, some of the things that you see, oh my gosh, yeah. 90 to 120 a month ongoing you know just for years how do they pee yeah, I'm gonna tell you something. i will say this i think if anybody appropriately prescribes opioids it's probably dentists because yeah. you give three days worth and you know after 72 hours if the patient's in significant pain they need to be you know reappointed and to, mm -hmm. to jeff's point if you manipulate bone tissue significantly you know the patient's going to be in pain you're the best judge of that because you're the clinician so write the script and remember that half the time they don't fill it and if they do fill it they take one or two and they can't wait to get rid of them so yep. so you treated their pain effectively and efficiently and that's what you're supposed to do treat your patient right and that's what jeff's point was and i i i 100 agree jeff absolutely yeah. so, so and, Tom, and, oh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry chad go ahead jeff. No, I was going to say that, Chad, to your point, when, so I had a really minor ankle surgery. I wasn't even put, you know, this is going back like 10 or 15 years. And it was just a little laparoscopic thing and, and didn't even have complete anesthesia or whatever. And, um, you know, they went in, they lavaged, they drilled a couple little holes. It was, it, it was not a, a huge deal. And um, when I left, they gave me a script for 90 oxycontin and 90 yep. um so mm -hmm. and they're like take one take one when you get home just take it you won't have any pain tonight you'll get a good night's sleep i'm like okay took it never took another one after mm -hmm. that 
honestly, there was almost no pain associated with like, I didn't even need ibuprofen. I, I mean, I needed nothing. Yeah. And I had 89 tablets mm -hmm. left. <laughs> what was yeah. the going rate on the street of Myrtle Beach at that point in time? Yeah, so, yeah I was going to say that that paid for my next vacation. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I did not do that. They were I know flush. You didn't. That was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> but now I, I will say this. Okay, keep in mind. Your job is to treat your patient's pain. Everybody understands that, right? But but the bottom line is everyone believes that dentists had something to do with, you know, increasing or pushing the opioid epidemic. L let me put it to you this way. I know plenty of people who got who knew the story about an adolescent who uh, got a prescription from an oral surgeon for an opioid for thermolar extractions, took the opioid, got addicted and led to a lifetime of addiction and died tragic, horrific as it is, it happened in my own family. I know the story very well, but I know a lot of people who get that prescription who never got addicted. I know a lot of people addicted to opioids that never got a script from an oral surgeon. And I know a lot of people who get opioids from orthopedic doctors. So to say that it was dentistry that caused it is really a, a stretch. But here's my scary point for today. Your patient takes an over very large dose of Norco. Everyone's concern is what? Respiratory depression, right? But think about it. If they're taking such a large dose of Norco that the hydrocodone in that Norco dose is causing them respiratory depression, I will guarantee you that the acetaminophen dose in that <laughs> yeah, it's worse. causing the liver damage. Yeah. So so really it's a two, it's a one-two punch. It's it's not just the fact that it's the opioid, it's the non-opioid that can cause the problem as well in large doses. Everyone knows it's a slippery slope. Why did dentists do it best? It's three days, right? And then after that, you reassess and more than likely, you don't re-prescribe it, you don't call in refills, or you can't call in refills, but you, can't, you won't write a new script because the patient's pain is managed. If you know what you're doing and you're using the ibuprofen and acetaminophen combination along with the opioid, it's a no-brainer that you don't need the opioid for more than 72 hours. I, I love that. Three days. There you go, Ryan Walsh. Three days. I like to say three days, fool. Three you're not, days. You're not creating junkies on three days of opiates. No. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I never had a problem because hydrocodone makes me hallucinate. I had it in a cough syrup one time and I had it for ear surgery one time. I took one pill both times and it makes me hallucinate. I'm up all night. I can't do it. I just can't do it. I just You're not the only ones. ones. Chad, a lot of people have that experience with opioids. Well, it could have been the crack pipe with it, Chad. The crack pipe, crack pipe is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. No one told you not to use the crack pipe yeah. with the opiate. Yeah, that was my fault. I'm sorry. I should have been there. <laughs> Damn apologize. it, Tom. Where's Damn your pharmacology guy when you need him? <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it. So. Um, I'm going to beg you for a little bit of research before the next time. Okay. Um, and I, I'm going to connect you with a company that I think would be inter interesting for you to talk to. But a big topic has come up in several of my lectures because I've used compounded topical for years. And I think it's the best thing ever. Oh, good topic. Yeah. And, and I would love, I know we talked about it and you're like, I have to brush up on that. But I think it would be a great topic for you you to, to brush up upon and maybe next time we can talk about it because I want to introduce you to some of my friends and one of the companies that I purchased from and 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 really I, I want to hear your take on it because I think it's it's the best stuff ever. And and I I once you see the ingredients, I want you to say, Oh yeah, this is why. But I know that you know a ton about anesthetics, but topical is something that a lot of people don't talk about, and I happen to. So I want to I want to get you introduced on that. Yeah, I would love to. I'll give you my 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 minute on it for sure. Okay, so so uh, my position on this is we we are, we are married to benzocaine for all the wrong reasons. Benzocaine is a good topical, don't get me wrong, but benzocaine has an ingredient in it that keeps it water soluble, so it won't penetrate the mucosa, so it won't cause allergy, and that ingredient is acid. And acid gets in our way because we already have acid in the tissue from those little jerks that make acid as a metabolic waste product. We're just adding acid to the tissue. And you talk about sloughing and burning. I'm a big fan of compounding. So LPT, right? Lidocaine, prolocaine, tetracaine. tetracaine. Great yeah. combination, right? BLT, benzocaine, lidocaine, tetracaine. Benzocaine, lidocaine, tetracaine with, uh, uh, with um, phenylephrine. 
lidocaine, prilocaine, tetracaine with phenylephrine. Phenylephrine as a vasoconstrictor and a topical, that's what actually marketed for a while under the brand name, the best darn topical. Because it really was. Yep. I mean, you really got potential for numbing for, for a long period of time without the acid. So, so what's not to love? And then there's, there's profound, there's tech, there's even, you know, now diclinine is back as diclopro. So you've got a plethora of, of topicals that are either compounded or available commercially besides benzocaine. Cetacaine, good stuff. Cetacaine is benzocaine, butanvin, and tetracaine in one combination that hygienists love because the, the liquid just flows and it gives yeah. long acting anesthetic relief without necessarily having to use, you know, aura kicks. What's not to love about the, the, everything that we're using that has very little acid in it. So no offense to the benzocaine manufacturers out there. I love you guys. You do a great job for dentistry, but there are other options out there that we can use. And yeah, Chad, I'll definitely look into it. For you. So yeah, I, I want to find the best one and I want to find a place for our members to maybe be able to get this stuff from, because I, I just, I don't know about you, Jeff, but I just love compounded topical. I uh, I could not agree more. And you want to build a practice, give painless injections. Mm. Honestly. Well done, sir. That, and it is not that hard to do. It, it's not like you have to be a magician to do it. Use a really good topical oh. and inject slowly. It is not magic. Mm. Absolutely. at all you're so, absolutely right and and your patients will say why is this taking so long is it hurting no then be thankful you yeah. know exactly. listen, listen yeah. to the music i'm playing for you right now yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah well yeah. i do have a question though tom and and maybe we'll get into this next time if you'd rather do that yeah. one of my concerns is the use of topical in um very young pediatric patients, the absorption. And then, you know, I, I think a lot of dentists come really close to that fine line margin, trying to get a lot of work done and, and, and maybe kind of pushing the envelope of where we should be as far as lidocaine toxicity. And, and so, you know, how does, I, I think this is a great topic. How much does the topical impact that anesthetic toxicity equation when we're figuring it in? So, and that's a good question, Jeff. Okay, so if you're using benzocaine, which a lot of times we use in pediatric patients, is a little scary because benzocaine can numb the gag reflex. It burns, it's, it's unsettling for the patient sometimes. I get that. So if you use, let's say, lidocaine topical, very little of that lidocaine topical is absorbed, thank goodness, through the mucosa, but some is. Honestly, if I had to be honest, I would tell you, I'm more worried about carbocaine. Carbocaine is a, is, a, is a good drug, don't get me wrong. I love it. And it's great for pa pediatric patients too. But to your point, Jeff, the problem is we try to get it all done at once, especially if the kid's needle phobic, right? Child's needle phobic, you don't want, you don't want to see the needle. So you might be tempted to say, okay, well, I want to get a lot of work done I'll, I'll use mepivacaine or carbocaine in more than one quadrant, you know, get all the injections done and then put the needle away. So there's no more needle, but the problem is you set up a perfect storm, especially with three or 4% concentration. So mepiv well, when pivacaine, the problem is it's the most difficult to break down anesthetic agent and it's concentrated at 3%, right? Okay. You just created the perfect storm. You gave the most difficult anesthetic to break down to the one patient who can't break anesthetics down because kids can't break down anesthetics that well. And you gave it to them in a big dose. So you're creating, you're setting up what? Cardiovascular collapse and respiratory failure. When, when in reality, it should have been a much smaller dose over multiple appointments. I get why we do what we do in dentistry. We're trying to do the best we can for our patients. But sometimes to your point, Jeff, and it was a good one, use a good topical, inject slowly and know what your limits are with your, for your patient. So you don't ever even get close to that line. I mean, have there been kids that have passed away in dental chairs from mepivacaine autoxis? Yes, absolutely. It's happened. I, I mean, I've seen cases of lidocaine overdoses. Of course. Yep. Yeah. Because lidocaine I mean, it, is safe, right? That's what we right. assume. Lidocaine is safe. But kids and old folks, okay? Yeah. 
pediatrics <laughs> and geriatrics. We don't do well in metabolizing drugs. So, and, and by the way, for our drugs. viewers, he was pointing to himself, not me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so we don't do so well in metabolizing drugs, so don't give us drugs that are difficult to metabolize, and don't give it to us in high doses. And the impression, of course, is mepivacaine and lidocaine are safe. Mepivacaine is safe because it's plain. Lidocaine is safe because lidocaine is safe for everybody, and really they're not. So yeah, we can talk more about MRDs and maximum doses uh, next time we get together for sure. Well, I, hang on before before we do this. So our our awesome friend Bobby, who I don't know where he is tonight, but like I just want, I think this ought to become a part of Dinks. Is we just give a where is Bobby Papert report at the beginning of the show because he's always somewhere. But um, our good friend Bobby Papert, who practices in Charlotte, he said, Please ask Tom whenever I find myself in surgery. I'll come out of the procedure, and, and I think he means him going through surgery, um, not him doing surgery. Um, I go through anaphylactic shock. It actually scares everyone more than myself. Um, last time under the knife, it was done with nothing but lidocaine, and I had the same result. Is it the preservatives? I have never heard of a true lidocaine allergy. Um, I've been told it's possibly a mast cell syndrome, but no solutions or correction. Now everyone is apprehensive to correct another injury. I really need this address. Do you have any ideas? He's not talking about dental surgery. He's talking about- No, no, he's talking about- Joint general surgery. Joint but he was saying even in his last general surgery, it was done with nothing but local, just lidocaine, and he mm. had the same reaction. Well, so I, is mm. is this a methylparaben thing? Well, that's the thing. You know, the problem is in dentistry, we have our own issues with preservatives that we call sulfites, right? So there's there is potential for sulfite allergy, which is rare. But in, in surgery, there can be multi-dose vials used and they do have preservatives. And it is possible if he's sensitive to, to the preservative that it can result in anaphylactic shock. But it's I think it's odd that the only thing they used was lidocaine and he had that same. So is it because there was something they used, some, some type of uh, thing they used during the procedure, like a certain gel or a certain sponge or something, you know, some kind of suture? That, that maybe triggered it, or was it indeed the lidocaine and the preservative? Well, depends, because I don't know what kind of lidocaine they used. If they used a multi-dose vial, perhaps, but they may have used a lidocaine that, that was preservative-free. Outside the world of dentistry, there's lots of variations of lidocaine, so it's really hard to say. I'd be more concerned that if it, you know, if it was the lidocaine that did it, I'd like to know which one they used, but it could very well be something else they used in the procedure, everything from the the, the thing they used to close him up to the, to the actual uh, thing they used to clean his wound during the procedure. Even povidone iodine, which is technically quite very poorly allergenic. Most people aren't allergic to it. It's possible if they even use that as a scrub. Maybe they use chlorhexidine gluconate as a scrub. And chlorhexidine gluconate can cause allergy as well. That's very true. Yeah, that's very that's, true. That's actually a great point. I didn't yeah, even think I, about that. You know, because you think about the studies from the UK on the on the death from chlorhexidine glu gluconate, and then I, all I'll say is Bobby definitely has more than nine lives. Oh God, <laughs> trust me, Good I've for him. We, been best friends with this guy since dental school. He absolutely has more than nine lives. He's already <laughs> exceeded the limit. Yeah. If so that here's Bobby had nine lives. He just used them all. <laughs> we, we need to we need to have a retreat that movie. at Bobby's place in Montana. He's got a place like near Big Sky on the Yellowstone River. Nice. Here's what we're gonna do. We need to have a Dinks retreat. And sorry, Bobby, for doing this publicly, but we're having a Dinks retreat in Montana at Bobby's place. We're just gonna figure out his problem. All right. I and that. and, and I do. think if we just get that done, he'll be good with it. I'm going to go I'm bringing the chlorhexidine gluconate scrub. I'm going to go on Amazon and pick up some surgical tools. You guys yeah. bring the chlorhexidine. We'll meet in Montana. Okay. No yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All you got to bring is the epi, Tom. We got everything else. <laughs> I'll even bring a defibrillator. <laughs> I was going to bring the circular saw, man. Maybe, yeah, but all right, well, whatever he likes, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, we're good. I don't awesome, think anything guys. bad could happen. No, what could go wrong? No, yeah, no. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> Famous last words. Yes. Watch this. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, all right, Chad, my close beer us out. This. We're at nine thirty already. It happened quickly. Yeah. Yes, it did. So always a pleasure, guys. Really, I respect oh, love everything having you, you Tom. Thank you for what you do for this profession. I don't know what we do without you. It's good to hear your voices. Uh, and it's good to hear what you do. And, and people really love you and appreciate you. I just wanted you to know that. Oh, I appreciate that, you. man. We don't know Thank what you. we do without you, Tom. So I'll see you in about three months. <laughs> see you in about three months. <laughs> Sounds good, guys. Yeah. Hold, hold the fort down in New Jersey. I'll do the best right. I can, but my arms are getting weak from all this cannabis that they're smoking. Oh, I didn't say that loud. <laughs> but I, oh, sorry. Hey, if you have any courses you want to uh, promote, feel free to do so in the comments below, man. We'd love to hear from it. Okay, we'll do All that. Right. Hey, guys. Thank Thanks, you, Tom. Tom. Take yeah. care, we'll Talk soon. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Close Bye. us out, Chatty. Well, everybody, it's been a great evening. And it's funny because I, I we had two topics. And see where that led us and how vast Tom's knowledge is. What a fantastic evening. Uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Uh, take a look at Tom's website, uh, drviola.com. Is that correct, Tom? I can see you down there. I believe it's Dr. I'll put it in the comments below, but take a look at Tom's website. See what he could offer you and your team. And uh, we'll see you next week. We got another great guest next week, and we look forward to seeing everybody then. Thanks. This everybody. is fun. Love you guys. Bye.